Good afternoon and welcome to the Cato Institute. We are actually starting right on time today because we have such a good crowd here. My name is David Bowes. I'm the Executive Vice President of the Institute and I'm glad to see everybody here. We are expecting more people uh, to come in, so if people are seeking to get the seats near the wall, uh, please make it easy for them to get in. I recently saw two documentaries on PBS's American Experiment uh, Experience series. Uh, the first one, a couple of weeks ago, Stonewall Uprising, was about the spontaneous resistance to a police raid that set off the gay rights movement in 1969. And then just uh, this Sunday night, I guess it was, Freedom Riders was about the courageous young black and white Americans who carefully planned a series of bus rides through the Deep South to challenge segregation. And the two films made me think about the connections and the differences between these social movements for freedom. And I wrote a couple of online columns about them. And the line that jumped out at me in Stonewall Uprising came from a police officer talking about trying to get, once again, patrons of a gay bar to load themselves into a paddy wagon. And what he said on the film was, this time they said, we're not going. And although they didn't actually use this line, when I watched Freedom Riders, I kept thinking, this time they said, we're going. Even though many of their parents and the representative of Attorney General Robert Kennedy had suggested it was a bad idea and they shouldn't do this. In different ways, a spontaneous group of people saying we're not going, a well-planned group of people saying we're going, set off these social movements. And in my view, the movement to overturn segregation was much more th quickly and thoroughly successful than the movement for equal rights for gay people. Although the cultural change for gay people in this country since 1969 has been stunning. And, of course, a key victory in the struggle for racial equality was the Supreme Court decision Loving v. Virginia in 1967, in which the court ruled that bans on interracial marriage violated both the due process and the equal protection clauses of the 14th Amendment. And that, of course, brings us to our topic today. As probably everybody here knows, California voters narrowly passed Proposition 8, which amended the California Constitution to eliminate marriage rights for same-sex couples in November 2008, the very day that President Obama was elected. A lot of people were depressed at that outcome. Chad Griffin was determined. He came up with the idea of a legal challenge. He created the American Foundation for Equal Rights to sponsor a federal court challenge to Prop 8 known as Perry v. Schwarzenegger, and we're glad to have Chad here today. Are you here in the room, Chad? Well, he may be out in the hall. Well, there he is, way in the back. Thank you, Chad. And he found a strong bipartisan team, or an odd couple, as most journalists have put it, uh, to put the case together. David Boyes and Ted Olson are two of the country's most accomplished lawyers, and they are perhaps best known for squaring off against each other in the historic Bush v. Gore case in 2000. This case was filed in 2009 and argued in 2010, and in August of last year, federal judge Vaughn Walker ruled that Proposition 8 burdens a fundamental right to marry, singles gays and lesbians out for different and unequal treatment under the law, and in language that may sound familiar, is unconstitutional under both the due process and equal protection clauses of the U.S. Constitution. And may I say, Chad, aren't you glad that the NAACP, the National Organization for Women, the Human Rights Campaign, the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force, and Nancy Pelosi were unable to block Judge Walker's nomination <laughs> <laughs> when Ed Meese and Ronald Reagan put him on the court? <laughs> this case is currently before both the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals and the California Supreme Court and is quite likely to eventually wind up before the U.S. Supreme Court. And we are tremendously honored to have such distinguished speakers with us here today. I'm going to go ahead and introduce all of them and then turn the podium over to them in turn. In particular, we're honored to have the two lawyers who have been shepherding, arguing, deposing, 
uh, throughout this case. Ted Olson is partner and co-chair of the Appellate and Constitutional Law Group at Dib- Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher. He was chief of President Reagan's Office of Legal Counsel and was President George W. Bush's Solicitor General. He has argued 56 cases in the Supreme Court. David Boyes is chairman of the firm of Boyes, Schiller, and Flexner. He served as chief counsel and staff director for the U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee when Edward Kennedy was chairman. And later, I recall particularly his role as special trial counsel for the Department of Justice in its antitrust suit uh, against Microsoft, uh, one of the first topics that Bob Levy took up here at Cato criticizing that uh, suit. We also have with us the two co-chairs of AFER's advisory board. John Podesta is the president and CEO of the Center for American Progress. He served as White House Chief of Staff for President Clinton. More recently, he was co-chair of President Obama's transition team. He's the author of a book, The Power of Progress, How America's Progressives Can Once Again Save Our Economy, Our Climate, and Our Country. And our final speaker, Robert A. Levy, is chairman of the Cato Institute, where he previously served as senior fellow in constitutional studies. He holds a Ph.D. in business and a law degree and is the co-author of The Dirty Dozen, How 12 Supreme Court Cases Radically Expanded Government and Eroded Freedom. And I hope the second edition won't have to refer to a baker's dozen. He may be best known as the architect of the successful effort to get the Supreme Court to affirm that the Second Amendment protects an individual right to bear arms. With all of those preliminaries out of the way, let me welcome Ted Olson. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Thank you, David. It's nice to see so many friends out in the audience. Um, I will try to keep to the 15 minutes that's been allotted to me because I think that a lot of David, David Boys and I have been involved in this case for uh, two years. As of this month, uh, we filed this complaint two years ago. Uh, the name of the case started off uh, Perry versus Schwarzenegger. Uh, the Perry is one of the four plaintiffs that we represent. Um, because of a a change in the composition of the uh, governor's mansion in in Sacramento and for uh, other political reasons, given Schwarzenegger's um, recent notoriety, the name of the the case is now Perry versus Brown. (laughs) So uh, that's a more felicitous way to deal with it. But what David and I have found in talking about this case uh, in many contexts uh, is that people really want to ask questions about the case. So I'm going to describe a little bit about the trial, the case, uh, where we are now, um, and then, and David will too, and then then we will will entertain questions after the other speakers are finished. Uh, We filed this case in May of of 2009, um, just two years ago. Um, We represent uh, two couples, uh, a two gay men who live in Southern California and a lesbian couple that live in Berkeley. They've been in long-term relationships with one another, and they have wanted to be married. Um, we went to trial in this case in January of the following year, in January of 2010, um, and we had a 12-day trial uh, and then a brief hiatus uh, during which the judge had some other things to attend to, and we had closing arguments in June. The judge rendered a a decision in this case in August, a 134-page explanation of findings of fact and conclusions of law, discussing every single one of the legal issues that were presented to the court. It was a non-jury trial, of course, um, and rendered a decision striking down Proposition 8. Uh, There was then an appeal by the proponents of Proposition 8, and let me step aside for a moment. The state of California did not want, through in the form of the attorney gen, then Attorney General uh, Brown and then Governor Schwarzenegger did not want to defend Proposition 8. The city of San Francisco, indeed, joined in as an intervener, taking our side, joining the side that we were on, saying that Proposition 8 was unconstitutional. The governor and attorney general simply offered no defense 
uh, the proponents of Proposition 8, the people that raised the money, authored the provision, put it on the ballot, intervened in the case uh, to defend and put on a defense of Proposition 8, uh, which they did so during the course of the trial. David will talk a little bit about uh, their witnesses and what happened to their witnesses when facing the prospect of cross-examination by David Boyes. Um, <laughs> But, um, but we did go to trial. Once the decision came down, the state of California decided not to appeal. They were, the, the attorney general and the governor concluded that indeed Proposition 8 was unconstitutional. They were not going to be present and participating in defending it any further. Um, and they did not appeal. The proponents did file a notice of appeal, um, and there is some question, and you may have some questions about that, with respect to the standing under Article Three of the Constitution of the proponents to participate in a lawsuit defending the constitutionality of a statute when the defendants in the case, the state of California itself, uh, are not present in the form of the governor or attorney general. It's an interesting but somewhat of a di interesting question, but it's something of a digression. Uh, we are now, uh, as David said, in the <coughs> Court of Appeals, uh, the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. Um, in, in California. The California, the, that court decided because of this standing question I mentioned, they wanted to find out from the California Supreme Court the extent to which under California law proponents of a ballot proposition could be in court to defend it. So they have asked the California Supreme Court for an answer to that question. So we are simultaneously in the Ninth Circuit and in the California Supreme Court. In the meantime, there's been a separate battle uh, our, our opponents, the proponents of Proposition 8, um, are challenging the judge's decision because the judge has uh, announced that he is gay and that he's been in a long-term relationship with another man. Now, everybody in California has known about that, and our opponents did know about it during the case and chose not to raise an issue with respect to that. But they have now sought to, after having just learned that they actually have lost the case, then they have now decided that this was not such a good idea to try it before that judge, and so they're trying to vacate the judgment. That's pending before the district court, another district court judge in San Francisco. Judge Walker has retired from the bench. Uh, he's no longer there, so another judge will be considering that on June 13th, I guess it is. So we are in, in the district court and in the Ninth Circuit and in the California Supreme Court all at the same time. There's one more issue. Uh, Judge Walker, when we tried the case, uh, decided that this was an important constitutional question affecting hundreds of thousands of Californians and millions of Americans and people throughout the world. And it was a constitutional challenge going to the very core of what the 14th Amendment Due Process Clause and Equal Protection Clauses mean, and that people of America ought to be able to see what was happening in that courtroom. Uh, we wholeheartedly agreed with him, so he issued an order allowing cameras to be very uh, discreet cameras in the courtroom, you really couldn't see them, to videotape the trial, and it was streamed into another courtroom, an overflow courtroom in the federal court in San Francisco, so that the hundreds, actually there were many, many people in, in San Francisco and throughout California that wanted to be in that trial. Uh, the courtroom was filled and the overflow courtroom was filled and his order said that this, this videotape will be streamed to other federal courthouses in the United States so you and other citizens could go into court and see what's happening in an American court on a constitutional question involving issues affecting all of us, really. The United States Supreme Court decided that that was not a good idea, that there were some um, there was a, 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 a inappropriate attention to local rules with respect to videotaping or, or streaming or televising a trial and stopped the day of the beginning of the trial, stopped that. But the videotape was the, did go forward uh, and there was a videotape therefore taken of the trial of every moment of the trial streamed to the other courtroom and then the judge allowed us to use the videotape during closing arguments. So when we made closing arguments, our side at least used excerpts from the trial itself in the closing argument. And our opponents, in the worst way, want that videotape to go away. 
And um, they first of all said that was because they, their witnesses would be intimidated by being on television. Um, we thought that was a rather frivolous argument because these were professional expert witnesses who had made lots of money testifying about these issues, writing books, teaching in the ac academia, um, academia, academia um, about those various issues. So that we thought the intimidation issue was a little bit frivolous. Uh, the, and that the real reason is that they do not want to see, they don't want the American people to see their evidence or their lack of their evidence. They don't want um, America to see the lack of reasons to defend Proposition 8 and this kind of discrimination. The trial itself went 12 days. We put on various different witnesses, um, ex including expert witnesses about the history of discrimination, uh, what it was, how, what it has been like in this country, psychologists that testified about the types of discrimination that take place and the damage that it's done, uh, the statistics with respect to marriage in other countries where there has been a permission of same-sex marriages or marriages to persons of the same sex, marriage equality, um, all kinds of things like that expert witnesses testified to. It was a remarkable education. One of the things I thought when you were talking, David, about um, discrimination, round, police rounding up people in bars, it was, I think many of you know, against the law in many places to serve uh, an alcoholic beverage in a, in a public place to a person who was gay. Against the law, the person who served that drink and the person who received that drink in a bar could go to jail. It was in the United States, President Eisenhower announced that someone who was gay could not hold a federal position, a federal a job working for the federal government. The history of discrimination is quite unpleasant to reflect on in this country. And it's a part of discrimination with respect to marriage. Uh, we put on evidence about what the history of marriage and how race was used as a basis to deny, deny people the right to marry. Slaves were pre prevented from marrying because that would be a sign of their independence. And when the Emancipation Proclamation was announced, slaves flocked to get, marriage, to get married because that meant that they were independent. Um, we had all of those witnesses and findings of fact with respect to that. Everybody in America should see that. Um, and so that is an important part of what's going on today. Um, the, the court very thoughtfully, the, the district court very thoughtfully went through all of that and rendered a decision that the Proposition 8 denied to individuals the fundamental right to marry and the, fun, the equal protection of the laws. Uh, just another word or two. The fundamental right to marry, 14 times the United States Supreme Court has announced that there is a fundamental right under the Constitution to marry. Um, that is a, a, a component of liberty, uh, privacy, the right to associate, and the right to identify oneself spiritually, and various other reasons. The Supreme Court has never said it's a right to marry someone of the opposite sex. Uh, nor did the Supreme Court ever decide that it was a right to marry someone of the same race. Because as, as we heard just a few moments ago, uh, in, in 1967 in Loving versus Virginia, the United States Supreme Court struck down Virginia's law and the laws of 14 other states that prohibited people of a different race from marrying one another. We pointed out during the course of the trial that in 1967, before the president, uh, after the president was born, his parents, if they had gotten married in Virginia and other states, would have been committing a felony. So the court has systematically struck down limitations on the right to marry, including the right to marry someone of the opposite sex, to marry a person if you are in prison, to marry to, and, and various other different things. So we're talking about a fundamental right who is being, which is being denied to a large segment of the American society. Uh, we asked, and I'll close on this, um, what reason does California and Californians have to deny this right to its citizens, to prevent people from entering into this relationship? Because if you're going to deny people a right, the right of association or the right of privacy, the right to be married like other people, what reason does, does California, what justification exists? And basically, our opponents 
could not put on any evidence to persuade the judge that there was a good reason to do this. In fact, several times during one part of the case, during motions for summary judgment, the judge said, well, what harm would it do to Californians or people of heterosexual orientation if people of the same sex were to be married? And, the, and our opponent didn't want to answer that question, and he tried to avoid the question, and the judge says, no, answer the question. What harm will it do to heterosexual marriage if people of the same sex get married? And our opponent, who was a very good lawyer, looked at the judge, paused, and said, I don't know. Now, we do know that marriage is a very important institution, and that the word marriage means a great deal. Civil unions are not the same. Domestic partnerships are not the same. The institution of marriage means a great deal. Our opponents kept saying that it is so important, the institution of marriage and the right to call yourself married is so important, we have to hold it back from people who wish to marry of the same sex because it would dilute and weaken the institution of marriage if people of the same sex were allowed to participate. Well, that is the point. The, mar the word marriage, the institution of marriage, what it means in this country isn't simply a legal thing. It is a social construct that is important in this country. And the example that I like to use is citizenship. What if you were told by your government that because you came from a certain national origin, that you could be all the things that a citizen could be, you could vote, you could travel, you could do own property, you could do everything, but you couldn't call yourself a citizen you wouldn't be a citizen. And if you can't be married in this country, you are being left out of a very, very important component of what our society respects and reveres. And we are telling people when we put a restriction of that nature in the constitution of the state, the biggest state in the United States, that it's okay. These people are different. They're not entitled to the same respect. They're not entitled to the same dignity. They're not entitled to equality. They are separate and they are different, and they're somehow second-class citizens. They are not the same. They are not okay. And that is a state-instituted license to discriminate, to harass, to bully, and to do great damage. That's what we're trying to overcome, and that's what the Proposition 8 case is all about. Thank you, Ted. As befits an experienced Supreme Court advocate, you hit your 15 minutes right on the button. Uh, now we'll hear from David Boyce. Thank you. I want to pick up where, where Ted left off, and that is what exactly is going on when a state like California says, we're not going to permit a certain group of citizens, in this case gay and lesbians, from marrying. They are not defining what the marital relationship is. They're defining who can enter into that relationship. And if you think, if you do a thought experiment, what if the state, and this is one of the things our judge asked us early in the case, what if the state simply got out of the marriage business entirely? What if the state, rather than sanctioning marriage, if, you, if you're going to get married, you're always going to, in this country, you're going to have a civil ceremony in the sense that you're going to have a civil marriage license, and then you may or may not have a religious ceremony that goes with it. Suppose that the state simply got out of the business of licensing marriages. They allowed you to enter into an arrangement, essentially as a matter of contract, um, uh, to determine how you'd live together, how property would be divided, inherited, how children would be raised. Um, and it allowed every religious institution to decide what kind of sacrament of marriage, if any, they were going to uh, use. Uh, the government would be out of the marriage business, and you would not have an issue of equal protection. Because equal protection and due process arises when you have state action. In this case, the state action of deciding we are going to license marriages, and we are going to license only a certain kind of marriage. In order to attack that state-sponsored discrimination, we said at trial that we wanted to establish three things. 
One, we wanted to establish that marriage was a fundamental right. And that was really common ground between the plaintiffs and the defendants in this case. Both sides agreed that marriage is a fundamental right. And they could hardly have said otherwise because the United States Supreme Court, as Ted has said, has repeatedly over the last more than 100 years affirmed that marriage is a fundamental right. The state of Wisconsin uh, passed a law that said if you have been in a marriage and you have not fulfilled the obligations of that marriage, for example, you have refused repeatedly to pay child support, you can't get another marriage license. That was a rational state purpose. You're trying to prevent people who have proven unwilling to fulfill the obligations of marriage from getting another marriage license. The United States Supreme Court said yes, that's a rational purpose, but it's still unconstitutional because marriage is such a fundamental right. It is so important to human dignity, it is such an important right related to the right of privacy and association and liberty, that even with a significant state interest, the state cannot prohibit people who have abused one marital relationship from entering into another. The state of Missouri uh, passed a law that said that imprisoned felons could not get married. And uh, people, Missouri tried to defend that law by saying, uh, in Missouri, you cannot uh, have uh, visits between a married person and uh, their spouse if they're felons, uh, so there can be no procreation. Marriage is for procreation. You can't have procreation, therefore we can prohibit marriage. And besides, they can't even live together, uh, so they can't enjoy the normal kind of uh, relationship that you expect married couples to have. Supreme, Supreme Court said, those are rational arguments, but it's still unconstitutional because marriage is much more than living together. It's much more than procreation. It's much more than any individual attribute of it because you can take away all of those attributes and you still have a relationship that has such significance to human liberty and human dignity that you cannot deprive even imprisoned felons, even people who are locked away for the rest of their lives from entering into marriage. So the idea that marriage was a fundamental right and it was a right that was inherent in principles of liberty and association, uh, rights of human dignity, was taken, I think, by both sides uh, as a given in the case. The second thing we set out to prove was that depriving gay and lesbian citizens of the right to marry seriously harmed them and seriously harmed the children that they're raising. Hundreds of thousands of children in California, millions of children in the United States, are being raised today by gay and lesbian couples. And we said, we're going to prove that the state prohibiting those couples from getting married not only harms those couples, but harms the children that they're raising. And we proved that. We proved that, as Ted said, with a wealth of statistical and analytical data. We had child psychologists, uh, experts. We had psycho psychologists. We had uh, sociologists, we had anthropologists, uh, we had statisticians, we had economists, all coming in and demonstrating the harm that forbidding marriage had. And we didn't stop there because the other side identified a number of expert witnesses. In fact, they started out with eight experts, just like we did. Um, uh, six of those experts, after we took their depositions, they dropped them um, uh, because those experts admitted what we were saying. They admitted 
that depriving gay and lesbian citizens of the right to marry seriously harmed them and their children. And one of the things that was interesting was that we um, played at trial the tapes that we took during the depositions of their experts. We introduced them. Um, and in an in, in a, a, uh, interesting uh, uh, argument, uh, they objected to our playing some of these tapes on the grounds that the person wasn't really an expert. Uh, <laughs> and the evidence um, for them not being really an expert was that they had disagreed with their point of view. Um, they lost that argument. Um, uh, the witness that they did put on the stand on cross-examination again admitted that depriving gay and lesbian citizens of the right to marry harmed them and harmed their children in significant ways. Um, the third thing that we set out to prove was that there was no benefit to anybody by depriving gays and lesbians from marrying. Um, the defense had sort of started out saying, well, gays and lesbians really don't need to marry. They've got civil unions. When they lost that part of it, they fell back on the argument, well, you've got to be careful because maybe this will harm the institution of heterosexual marriage. Now, if you think about that a little bit, there's a certain common sense gap um, that exists. Um, I, I ask uh, those of you um, who, like me, have uh, children who have either just gotten married or are in the process of considering getting married, and uh, whether you think it would dissuade them if they learned that their gay and lesbian couple down the street were able to get married. Um, or for those of you who are married at the present time, whether you would decide, well, let's get divorced because now gays and lesbians are going to get married in this, in this state. Uh, so I think that there's a, a certain common sense gap there. But lawyers spend a lot of their time uh, proving things that are common sense um, because that's, what, that's what one of the things we do in court. And, um, uh, and again, we brought in a wealth of evidence that there was no harm. Uh, and again, on cross-examination, even the defendant's own expert witnesses conceded that they had no evidence of harm. And based on that record, the trial court wrote a decision which if you have not read, I really commend to you. It is a great decision because it talks about the development of equality in this country and the equality of marriage and the important ways that marriage has changed over time. It talks about the fact that during slavery, slaves were prohibited from marrying. And one of the things that happened when slavery was abolished was slaves immediately rushed to get married because this was part of what made their relationship a dignified, respectable relationship. It gave them a sense of belonging, a sense of equality. Uh, if One of the things that was most striking to me um, some years ago was when Gavin Newsom in San Francisco uh, opened the window for gays and lesbians to get married. It was a short window and it was closed quite quickly. But in 2004, but people rushed to California to get married. It, it was that important. People traveled there, stood in line all night to get a marriage license. And when something is that important to people, I think we have to, as a society, ask ourselves, what are we doing? in trying to prohibit them from engaging in that. And so I think that when you have the opinion that you had, when you have the record that we have, we have, I think, a strong legal case for eliminating these kind of bans, both under equal protection and under due process. We have some particular arguments as to why this should happen in California, uh, as, um, as, as Ted alluded to. Uh, California uh, had an established right to gay and lesbian marriage that was then taken away. Uh, that's something that's important under uh, some uh, court precedents. Uh, it was a situation in which California has this crazy quilt in which 
um, because you had a right to get married for a period of time, you have 18,000 legal gay and lesbian marriages. They're recognized by the state of California. So you can have in one house on a street a gay and lesbian couple that are legally married, next door a gay and lesbian couple who want to get married but can't. And indeed, the couple that is married, if they get divorced, they can't remarry. Uh, they can't even remarry themselves. And that is something that strikes people instinctively as not being a rational line for states to be, to be trying to draw. But the fundamental issue is the issue of civil rights, of individual rights. And I think it is why you see people up here that don't necessarily agree on a broad range of other issues. And it is because we all have an interest in protecting individual rights against government discrimination. There may come a time when government gets out of the marriage business. But until government gets out of the marriage business, it is critical that government not be involved in discriminating between certain citizens and certain other citizens, choosing between certain religious doctrine and other religious doctrine. One of the things that people uh, on the other side said, they gave, had a press conference every uh, afternoon. And they began by first saying they don't need it, then saying it'll be dangerous, and then finally at the end they began to say, Ted Olson and David Boys are trying to elevate science above religion. And I think that that, in a Freudian way, revealed what was really going on here. Because in California, with domestic par partnerships, that the California Supreme Court has ruled give you all of the rights of marriage except the right to be call yourself married. What you have is simply the state making a distinction, like saying people of a certain national origin can call yourself citizens, people of another national origin or another sex or another sexual orientation cannot call yourself citizens, even though you have the same rights. That is the kind of second-class citizen designation that the Constitution prohibits states from doing. Thank you. Thank you, David. And now we will hear from John Podesta, one of the co-chairs of the advisory board. Uh, well, I want to start by thanking David Bose. Uh, particularly, David, I want to thank you uh, for giving us that history of Vaughn Walker's uh, nomination and the opposition to his nomination to the, to the district court. I hope my conservative friends who are considering the nomination of Goodwin Liu, who's also from San Francisco, nominated to the Ninth Circuit, will, will, uh, will listen to that history. Sometimes judges can surprise you, especially when they're following the law and the Constitution. Um, uh, I want to thank... I want to thank Ted Olson uh, uh, and David Boyce, uh, not, uh, obviously not only for that important update uh, and for the ex explication of, of what really went on uh, in, in this case, but for the tremendous legal work that the two of you and your, and your team uh, did in the Perry case. Uh, I think it will really uh, go down as uh, in historic terms uh, for, from the perspective of people uh, who really care about the law, and I, I really want to uh, take this opportunity to thank you both. Uh, I want to thank Cato again for hosting this event, uh, not only to reflect on the progress we've made in challenging Proposition 8 uh, in this case, but also the progress we've made uh, on marriage equality in general. And I want to provide uh, just briefly some broader context uh, for how far we've come on that question uh, and how far we need to go to expand uh, liberty in this country. Fifteen years ago, the thought of same-sex couples being allowed to legally marry was hard, I think, for most Americans to even contemplate. You probably had to work at the Cato Institute to even wrap your head ar uh, around that idea. Uh, no state had marriage rights uh, for same-sex couples. Barely 30 percent of the country thought gay couples uh, should have the right to marry. Uh, Ten years before that, that number was in the low teens. 
1996, the Defense of Marriage Act was passed into law by a vote of 85 to 14 uh, in the United States Senate and 342 to 67 uh, in the House of Representatives. Senators and representatives who today are outright supporters of marriage equality voted for DOMA. Uh, and of course, the president who signed it uh, has not only changed his views on DOMA, uh, but now is a vocal supporter uh, of marriage equality. Yes, today the world looks very different. Uh, just 15 years later, marriage equality for same-sex couples is quickly, I think, becoming a fairly mainstream idea that is embraced by liberals, by conservatives, by moderates, and of course, and not surprisingly, by libertarians alike. Uh, five states, Iowa, Vermont, Connecticut, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts, uh, as well as the District of Columbia, have legalized same-sex marriages. Uh, eight states offer same-sex civil unions or domestic partnerships that provide many of the benefits of marriages, uh, but as Ted noted, uh, are not the same thing uh, as marriage. Uh, and three additional states recognize same-sex marriages that, are, that were performed legally uh, in other jurisdictions. Several national polls consistently show that a small but growing majority of the country supports marriage rights, uh, including about uh, two-thirds of Democrats, almost 60 percent of independents, and more than a third uh, of Republicans. I think, uh, as, as David was, uh, was noting, if you look at people under 40, uh, two-thirds of people under 40 uh, support marriage equality in, in this uh, country today. Uh, promising federal court cases are challenging the Defense of Marriage Act. Uh, in an important decision a few months ago, the President instructed the Justice Department to stop defending uh, Section 3 of the law uh, in these cases, although the government uh, is still enforcing uh, DOMA overall. Uh, and the American Foundation for Equal Rights challenge to Prop 8 and its odd couple co-counsels uh, have elevated the case for marriage equality in a way I think that was unthinkable, as I noted uh, just 15 years ago uh, in 1996, and put the real uh, stakes uh, of discrimination uh, in the record uh, and before Americans to see, particularly if we could see the videotapes of that, uh, of, of that trial, which I hope that we'll be able to do uh, in the near future. I want to emphasize uh, the polling point in particular. The change in public opinion is not only happening, it's happening very quickly. In fact, most of the spike in public support for marriage equality uh, has come uh, in just the past couple of years. Uh, in 2004, when marriage equality was a controversial, uh, some uh, say game-changing issue at the ballot box, uh, support for marriage equality was only at 34 uh, percent, not much higher than it was uh, in 1996. But today, uh, in the most recent poll, uh, by the Washington Post, 53 percent of Americans support marriage equality uh, for same-sex couples. Despite recent high-profile tax uh, on marriage for gay couples, including Prop 8's passage in California, marriage equality and fairness clearly has strong and growing momentum uh, in the United States. Part of this momentum comes from the fact that Gay rights are in increasingly not just something uh, progressives or liberals endorse. Uh, in 2004, Vice President Cheney opposed the Bush administration's support for a federal marriage amendment defining marriage as a union of one man and one woman, uh, a surprising public uh, position for a prominent uh, conservative to take at that time. Uh, but since then, former First Lady Laura Bush, her daughters Barbara and Jenna, among others, are on the record supporting marriage equality. Uh, and just a few months ago, uh, we heard from Rhode Island's former Republican senator and now independent governor, uh, Link Chafee, express support for marriage equality during his inaugural remarks. Uh, he urges state legislature to catch up to its New England neighbors and quickly par pass uh, marriage equality. Another Republican turned independent, New York City Mayor Mike Bloomberg, had le has lent his name and video testimony to the New Yorkers for Marriage Equality campaign. And the New York Times this past weekend reported uh, the surge in support from Republican donors for the New York State push for marriage equality, which is pending uh, in their legislature. Uh, as welcome, I think, as this change is across the political spectrum, it's clear that an appeal to discrimination has not completely lost its potency. Uh, we see a number of candidates seeking their party's uh, presidential nomination, not just attacking marriage equality, but as my uh, CAP colleague Jeff Corelli, who's here, uh, his research has shown they're attacking things like workplace non-discrimination policies and allowing gay couples to adopt basic rights that 
uh, every worker or family should be entitled to have, regardless of who they love. Um, these appeals to divide America, I think, will ultimately be rejected. I believe uh, that because the expansion of gay rights is an example of America at its best. What historically made America great is our promise of freedom and equal opportunity to all our citizens. While we have failed to live up to that promise at times in the past, whether for women or for racial or religious minorities, our country is constantly evolving for the better, expanding the circle of opportunity, deepening the, deepening the meaning of freedom. We've evolved, uh, we're evolving because countless policymakers, activists, and lawyers, including many of the people here in this room, uh, keep working tirelessly to root out injustice and extend America's promise to every citizen. The expansion of rights to gay people, including marriage rights, is another step in our journey to form a more perfect union. This is something even Cap and Cato can agree on, uh, which, of course, is probably no small feat. We don't agree on all that much. And, uh, there are a few other issues that we do agree on. But it's uh, why I'm happy to serve with Bob Levy uh, as the co-chair of American, uh, the American Foundation for Equal Rights uh, Advisory Board. Like the partnership between Ted Olson and David Boyce, our partnership shows that marriage equality can transcend political labels to fo focus on basic rights uh, and smart public policy, policy that's grounded in our nation's most enduring founding principles of equality, fairness, and liberty. Our partnership under, uh, also underscores our shared belief that a society that respects individual liberty must end the unequal treatment of gay couples under the law, and we both recognize that at its heart, Marriage equality is about treating our fellow citizens with dignity and respect, whether they're gay or straight. I'm happy to be here at Cato today, continuing the conversation about marriage equality with Bob, and I look forward to hearing his own remarks uh, and to the following discussion. Bob, thanks again for hosting this event, and I'll turn the floor over to you. Thank you, John. Thanks, John. And now Cato Chairman Bob Levy. Many thanks to our panelists, and thanks to you for coming out in uh, somewhat inclement weather. Um, we libertarians here at Cato, we have sort of a unique perspective on public policy. As you probably know, we're liberal on um, many of the social and civil liberties and foreign policy issues, but conservative on domestic um, economic, fiscal, and regulatory questions. Uh, conservatives and, and libertarians are generally allied in a pretty vigorous effort to limit government power. But there is a corollary, let's call it a flip side, to a government power, and that is individual liberty. And on that score, conservatives and libertarians will occasionally uh, disagree. And today's discussion of uh, same-sex marriage is a, a prime example of that uh, disagreement. So why is it that libertarians argue that there ought to be a right to uh, same-sex marriage? Thomas Jefferson set the stage in the Declaration where he wrote, to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. So the purpose of government is to secure individual rights. And that means uh, that we must prevent some persons to, from harming other persons. So here is the threshold question. Whose rights are being violated and must therefore be secured uh, by government action when two gay people get married? And the answer, of course, is nobody's rights have been violated and nobody is harmed by the union of two consenting gay people. And even if it could be shown, and here the evidence goes the other way, even if it could be shown that heterosexual marriages are vital uh, for child rearing, that fact would have constitutional significance only if you could also show that allowing gay marriages somehow uh, precludes or reduces the number of heterosexual marriages. The key question, and it was raised by David uh, Boys in his remarks, is why is it that government uh, should be involved uh, at all in the marriage business? Uh, it should not. For most of Western history, marriage was a matter of private contract between the betrothed uh, parties. Marriage today could very well follow uh, that tradition, it should be a private arrangement requiring minimal or no 
government intervention. Some religious or secular institutions would recognize gay marriages. Others uh, would not. Still others would call them domestic partnerships. Uh, join whichever group you wish to join. No one would have to join any group, and no group would have to adopt a definition that members of the group found to be offensive. The rights and the responsibilities of the partners would be governed by personally tailored uh, contracts, consensual bargains like those that control most of the uh, interactions among people in a, a free society. Government benefits, to the extent that they are dispensed and to the extent that obligations are imposed by government, that could be just as easily triggered by other objective criteria, leaving the definition of marriage in the hands of private institutions. The qualifying criterion might be, for example, an affidavit identifying the partner certifying uh, that the partnership is intended to be exclusive and permanent uh, within a common residence with shared responsibilities. It's not necessary to key benefits uh, to marriage, and in fact, 60% of Fortune 500 companies now extend benefits to domestic partners. Now, that's the ideal. Regrettably, however, government has interceded, enacting more than 1,000 federal laws and who knows how many uh, state laws dealing with issues like taxes and child custody uh, and inheritance. And whenever government imposes obligations or dispenses benefits, the Constitution is implicated. And the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment says that no state may deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. That provision, of course, is the relevant constitutional issue uh, when it comes to same-sex marriage. And I must say that that is where conservatives and libertarians sometimes uh, part company. And I want to explore that parting of company by looking at two uh, particular topics. One is federalism, and the other is this issue of uh, fundamental rights. First, with respect to federalism, why don't we simply leave uh, same-sex marriage question up to each state. Uh, you may know that from the get-go, at the time of the framing, the Constitution only applied to the federal government. The First Amendment, for example, says Congress shall make no law. It says nothing about the states. We learned over 80 years that the states can be every bit as tyrannical as the feds, slavery being the case in point, and so we fought a civil war. We passed some post-Civil War amendments, including the 14th, and the 14th Amendment, effectively makes the Bill of Rights and other provisions in the Constitution applicable against the states. For the first time, the federal government could intervene if the states violated constitutionally secured rights. And that significantly altered the balance between state and federal governments. Although the states have broad discretion in fashioning rules for same-sex marriage, the U.S. Constitution sets the outer limit. So federalism, for example, surely allows some states to recognize same-sex marriages while other states opt to privatize all marriages and still others call all marriages domestic partnerships. But the states may not discriminate as between same-sex and opposite-sex unions without justification, and none has been shown. If the states discriminate by recognizing heterosexual but not homosexual marriages, federalism does not excuse compliance with the Equal Protection Clause, and that is the crucial change to federalism rooted in ratification of the 14th Amendment. And I think somewhat hypocritically, the same conservatives who invoke federalism uh, to argue for Proposition 8 uh, proposed in May of 2003 the Federal Marriage Amendment, which defines marriage throughout the country as the union of a man and a woman. That amendment prohibits states from recognizing same-sex marriages within their own borders, even if desired by the state's citizens. And it also bars the legal incidence of marriage, such as civil unions and domestic partnership. That regime would be fundamentally at odds with principles of federalism. Uh, next, consider this issue of fundamental rights that, again, both David and Ted mentioned. Since the New Deal, the courts have rigorously reviewed government regulations only if they infringe on a fundamental right. And to qualify as fundamental, a right either has to be implicit in the concept of ordered liberty or deeply rooted in our nation's uh, traditions and culture. And how that right is defined, narrowly or broadly, makes all the difference. 
and can even dictate the outcome of the case. Some conservatives argue that the right to same-sex marriage doesn't meet the criteria for a fundamental right, and therefore, the courts should defer to the legislature. Well, I'd like to talk about two cases that address this question. The first case is Raish V. Gonzalez. A sick person claimed a fundamental right to use medical marijuana in California where the use of such uh, uh, narcotic is legal, and she had, in fact, a doctor's order. The Court of Appeals characterized the right as the use of narcotics for medical purposes. So Mrs. Raish lost because medical marijuana said the court uh, is not indeed required for ordered liberty, nor is it deeply rooted in our nation's traditions and culture. Suppose the court had adopted Ms. Race's characterization of the right, and that is the liberty to pursue a less painful life without infringing on the rights of anyone else. She would have won that case. And for a contrary example, consider the case of Lawrence v. Texas in which the Supreme Court overturned a Texas law that criminalized consensual homosexual sodomy. Texas lost that case. Why? Because the court characterized this relationship between two men as being within the liberty of persons to choose. Suppose the court had said that this right is simply about the right to practice gay sex. The right would not have been deemed fundamental. Which characterization is correct? Uh, the nasty little secret of constitutional law is that in part, both of them are correct. Raish was indeed trying to live with less, less pain, and she was also using medical marijuana. Uh, Lawrence was pursuing a private, a consensual relationship. He was also engaged in gay sex. And similarly, Chris Perry's right in Perry v. Schwarzenegger could be characterized narrowly as marrying another woman, which might not be considered deeply rooted in our traditions, or it could be characterized as Ted and David and ultimately Judge Walker did as choosing a spouse and forming a household, which would be deeply rooted. So sometimes courts can rule uh, based on how it is that they describe the right. And that is, in the libertarian view, the foolishness of bifurcating our rights into fundamental and non-fundamental categories. All rights, enumerated, unenumerated, fundamental, non-fundamental, should be rigorously protected by the courts. And that is the view of most libertarians. Too often, it is not the view of many uh, conservatives. So from liberals, uh, with all due respect to Mr. Podesta, we sometimes get uh, too much government, an enlargement of state power. And from conservatives, uh, with all due respect to Ted Olson, uh, we sometimes get too few freedoms, protection of some, but not all, of our constitutionally secured rights. The left and the right uh, are selectively indignant about the proper role of government. Uh, that reflects, I think, an inconsistency among both liberals and conservatives on their views of rights uh, and powers. Libertarians, by contrast, have a consistent, I'd call it minimalist, view of the proper role of government. We want government out of our wallets and out of our bedrooms. Libertarians view the powers of government very narrowly, the rights of individuals very broadly, and that, of course, was precisely uh, the vision of the framers. Thanks very much. Okay, everybody was right on time. We have about half an hour for questions, so I'm going to start calling on questioners. Uh, please wait for a microphone to get you and uh, state any name and affiliation you're willing to own up to. And I'll take a question right there on the aisle. Justin Wilson. Um, I know a fair amount has been said about the, I guess, the... Uh, how do we get to success in terms of timing and the Supreme Court and the various cases? I'm, you know, there's the New Yorker article that sort of examined your case and others. Can you give us a sense of the roadmap to success and where you see it going and maybe even throw in a little bit of Supreme Court handicapping? 
Right now, we're stalled in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, the Ninth Circuit had a very expedited briefing schedule. We got a district court opinion in August. We argued the case after full briefing uh, the first week in December of last year. Um, uh, since then, um, the court, Federal Court of Appeals has asked the state uh, Supreme Court for information on standing. We're not going to get a decision on that until late this year, maybe even early next year. Uh, at that point, the Federal Court of Appeals will probably take some additional time. So it is uh, quite possible at this point that even if the United States Supreme Court takes it, um, uh, we don't have a decision from the United States Supreme Court for another two years. Um, uh, that's very disappointing, I think, um, uh, because uh, to suspend this constitutional right during this extended period uh, we think is inconsistent with what the court should be doing. But uh, we're, we're, we're sort of stuck with that. Um, uh, with respect to um, uh, what happens if we get to the Supreme Court, uh, and it is, it is quite possible that the Supreme Court um, would not take this case uh, because of the, some of the aspects that relate to California that make it somewhat different than, than the states generally. But if, if they take the case, um, uh, we are not giving up on any judge. Uh, we're not taking anybody for granted. Uh, we're not saying, look, we've got these people. We are not going to lose these people. Um, uh, in fact, uh, Ted and I actually have a, a, an arrangement. I'm going to get the four justices that I got in Bush v. Gore. He's going to get the five justices or their successors <laughs> uh, that he got in Bush v. Gore, and we're going to have a unanimous 9 nothing opinion. <laughs> Okay, next question, right here. Hi, uh, Michael Willey, graduated last year from Georgetown Public Policy Institute. Thank you all for coming. My question is to the uh, odd couple co-counsel. Um, when it comes to uh, making your case before the Supreme Court, how are you going to argue um, for marriage equality. I, I worked at the Heritage Foundation last summer and proposed a question to them, of, is marriage a natural right? And the answer came back both yes and no, which I had never known that could happen with natural <laughs> rights. Um, I'm, I'm, my question is basically, are you going to argue it as an extension of liberty or will it itself be a new constitutional right protected for all citizens? I'll, I'll take a shot at it, uh, and then, um, David, am I, do I need to push oh, you? I'm okay. Um, as I said before, the Supreme Court has 14 times discussed what marriage is as a fundamental right, starting in 1888. Uh, and, the, and the Supreme Court has characterized that in different circumstances as an aspect of liberty, an aspect of privacy, uh, an aspect of the fundamental rights of association uh, and spiritual identity. Um, and, and the Supreme Court has examined what marriage means in the context of individuals getting married, as David said, if they're in prison, uh, individuals getting married uh, because they're violating some law because they're not paying child support. The Supreme Court has looked at it in the context of a person wanting a divorce and in the context, context of a person wanting to engage in contraceptive activities. And we're in, the, in the Lawrence versus Texas case, the Supreme Court talked about it, it was dicta, in the context of persons wanting to marry someone of the same sex, persons in a homosexual relationship, and the privacy inherent in that relationship. Um, and Justice Scalia, uh, in the defense, in, in the dissent in that case, says, my gosh, if, you've gone, if we've gone this far, what possible reason can there be to deny individuals the right to marry someone of the same sex? Um, and he said, although the majority opinion says we aren't deciding that, he said, don't you believe it? He basically saw the history of the Supreme Court's decisions involving marriage as a relationship between two individuals that's necessary to form a bond in our society. 
which includes the private right to associate, the privacy engaged, uh, uh, engaged in, a, in a personal relationship, the liberty to engage in a personal relationship. So the Supreme Court has talked about that in terms of not producing babies, contraception, of getting divorced, getting out of marriage. Um, and in people in prison, as David talked about, who, c who can't procreate and so forth. So it is all of those things. And we're not going to go into the Supreme Court and say it is this and not this. I mean, we're going to take advantage of all of those unbroken line of decisions that go back now 124 years. And we're also going to be talking, of course, about equal protection and the denial to a portion of our population of the, of the rights to this important relationship. Uh, and I w didn't say when I was up before, but let me just say a word about the testimony that <clears throat> was given during the trial by the plaintiffs themselves. Each of the four plaintiffs got on the witness stand and described what it was like to be gay, when they first realized that they were, the immutable characteristic they are born that way, they don't choose to be gay, what it means to be in a society that discriminates on the basis of sexual orientation, how they can explain or fail, how, how difficult it is to explain their relationship as a partnership, which sounds like a business deal, and no one celebrates the getting together in a domestic partnership. You don't see flowers being sent or parties being had or receptions and so forth. But those little things and those big things about what that discrimination means. And that ties in with the equal protection argument. So we are going to make all of these arguments, and we're going to take advantage of the Supreme Court's decision in the Romer case, where Colorado <laughs> took away the rights of gay and lesbian individuals, and the Lawrence case, where the Supreme Court talked in terms of the fundamental right to engage in private, consensual, sexual activity. If it is a, pri if it is a fundamental right to engage in that activity, how can engaging in that fundamental right be a basis for denying the fundamental right to marry? You can't use a the exercise of a constitutional right to deny the exercise of another constitutional right. So we're going to make as complete a package as we can. Yes, ma'am, right there. Wait for the mic. Hi, I'm Cynthia Butler, I'm an attorney in town. Hi, John Podesta. Um, I, I, I have two questions. One, you, Mr. Olson, you talked about the harm, um, that there was no harm, they couldn't discern any harm. Was there a finding that sodomy was not harmful, and is that a necessary finding? And with respect to Mr. Boyce, um, clearly there are restrictions on liberties. Clearly you can't marry your mother, you can't marry a child. There are categories of things that we do restrict liberties on with respect to marriage, so it's not completely across the board a free for all, you know. You, so, and what this is is a marriage that's um, that's being proposed based on um, uh, not not an attribute so much as an action, as a as uh, a behavioral attribution. So, my question is, if you know, it does the Fourteenth Amendment compel any behavioral attribution? to attach to the civil rights, civil liberties? Because to me, that opens an enormous Pandora's box. I mean, you can't, I mean, what's your thought on that? Because I mean, how, first of all, what distinguishes this type of behavioral attribute attached to a civil right from the, you know, the category of the things that we deny people civil liberties? You can't marry a mother, you can't marry a child, you can't marry five people, okay? Wait, wait. Uh, da you see what I'm David's going to answer the long part of your question <laughs> okay. after I answer the short part of your question with respect to sodomy, and you're talking about private consensual behavior between persons of the same sex. The Supreme <laughs> Court of the United States has already decided that in Lawrence versus Texas, that people have a fundamental right to engage in <laughs> conduct such as that. California does not prohibit that. California allows people of the same sex to engage in that behavior, that p p allows people of the same sex to adopt children, it allows people of the same sex to live together in domestic partnerships, and so it was not necessary to have any finding of that. The question is whether it can be called marriage or not, and that is the ground on which we fought this case. Now, David get, will answer the harder part of your question. <laughs> I'm sure he was understanding it. 
<laughs> I, well, um, a a actually, if I understand it, I think you may you may have answered that part too. I, I actually don't think that um, uh, marrying your mother or your sister or your brother is actually a behavioral thing. Uh, I think that, uh, that that's probably a status thing as well. Um, but if it if um, the issue is um, can you restrict uh, gay and uh, lesbian couples from marrying because they will engage in gay and lesbian sex? The answer under Lawrence is absolutely not, because um, uh, the Supreme Court has already ruled that that is a constitutionally protected right. Uh, moreover, um, because California already approves of that and indeed um, supports that by giving uh, same-sex uh, civil unions uh, full rights, uh, that could not have been a, uh, a basis for decision um, supporting Proposition 8 uh, in California in any event. Um, uh, with respect to status distinguish distinctions, um, that is, uh, is it uh, necessary to say that you can marry your mother or your sister or your brother? Um, I, uh, certainly not, uh, because uh, you first look at, is that marriage a fundamental right? It is. Why is it a fundamental right? Liberty, uh, privacy, association, uh, spiritual uh, uh, dignity. Um, and you ask, do you, is, it, is, there, is there a basis consistent with those for depriving certain people of the right to marry? Um, and with respect to gays and lesbians, uh, nobody's been able to come up with a basis for that. Uh, with respect uh, for prohibitions uh, on incest and the like, there are a lot of rationales for that. Um, uh, with respect to polygamy, there are some rationales for that. But with respect to uh, discriminating against gays and lesbians, uh, that was exactly what the trial was about, and nobody uh, could come up with any basis uh, for discriminating on that basis. Because that is so, then there is no justification for the state stepping in to enforce that kind of discrimination um, simply based on preferring, for example, one religious doctrine over another. May, okay. I, may I expand? Oh, I'm sorry, yes. Uh, let me just expand briefly on what, uh, what David has said. You know, this, this question frequently arises that by recognizing same-sex marriage, aren't we embarked down this slippery slope toward incest and, and uh, polygamy? And I, I think the framework is this. Uh, when rights are set out in the Constitution and deemed to be constitutionally protected, they are not absolute rights. The Constitution says, for example, Congress shall make no law abridging f uh, freedom of speech. And yet we have laws, for example, against uh, defamation, against uh, falsely shouting fire in a crowded theater, against incitement uh, to riot, uh, against uh, lying in commercial advertising, and until recently against naming a political candidate within 60 days of an election in an ad that's uh, funded by a corporation. So Congress makes, me, makes no law. It means Congress makes uh, lots of laws, and in the same sense, uh, when we say that there is a right that's constitutionally protected, what we really mean is that we presume that there is such a right and the burden shifts from the individual vindicating that right. The burden is not the individual's. The burden shifts to government. Government must justify any compromise that it proposes. Uh, on that right. And that means government has to jump through some considerable hoops, the first of which is it has to show that there's a compelling need for regulation, the second of which is to show that the regulation is going to satisfactorily accomplish the objective that government seeks, and the third of which is to show that this same objective could not have been accomplished in a manner that would have been less invasive of our individual rights. That's the framework in which we should evaluate whether there is a right to incest or a right to polygamy. The government must show that there's justification for infringing on such a right. Okay, right there. And then take a microphone over here to the lady in the front row mezzanine. Michael. Uh, Nigel Ashford, Institute of Humane Studies. Uh, would Ted Olson and John Podesta like to comment on the issue raised by David Boyes and Bob Levy that government should get out of the marriage business completely? I will be happy to. The, that was almost the first question that the judge asked during the opening statements. Um, judge Walker asked that question. 
And we answered the question that that would be fine. That would, that would, if the government is not imposing a limitation or pro, pro, imposing rules and regulations that limit a fundamental right or dis, divide our citizenship or make classifications, then a lot of these constitutional questions diminish or disappear. Now, it's, and I said to the judge, it's not going to happen. Um, it, as the Supreme Court said in the, in the divorce case, that the states have been involved in the regulation of the relationship called marriage right from the beginning. It's shot through, uh, Bob says, a thousand different federal statutes. I think the, the, it's like 1,400 different federal statutes that describe benefits and various different uh, advantages or disadvantages or disabilities or abilities and so on and so forth with respect to marriage. And every state has just scores and scores and scores of that law, the, of, of those laws. I, from, he, I, he said, um, I, he said, why not? And I said, it's a political thing. The state's not going to get, get away, say, we're going to just open the field and, and walk away from all those laws. And he said, how do you know? And I said, I'm not a politician, you know, but I'm, that is, a, as a predictive matter, it is not going to happen. Um, so it might be fine if, we, if the state had never, as an original matter, had never gotten into that subject, but we're just not dealing in that world today. Um, uh, well, people accuse me of being a politician, although I'm also a lawyer. Uh, the, uh, and I think that, that uh, Ted's answer is, is, is the correct one. For anybody who's counting, there are 1,138 federal benefits of marriage uh, in the current United States Code. Uh, and I think that, that that is important and relevant to, to the question of whether one takes the more radical step that I know Bob would endorse uh, to, do, to essentially take the government completely out of the marriage business uh, and, and treat it as simply uh, another form of, of uh, private contract. Uh, and uh, again, I think that's uh, a, uh, a step that needs, need not be taken in order to secure uh, the equal treatment and the liberty uh, of gay and lesbian uh, citizens. So, it, 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 you know, if the, if the if particularly if states wanted to adopt more neutral principles, get out of uh, and eliminate marriage, uh, create a civil union system uh, for everyone in the, in, uh, who is, a, who is a, a citizen or resident of their state, I would have no problem with that. But I don't, I don't think it's a cause we need to undertake in order to provide marriage equality for all our citizens. I might note that I wrote a column calling for the privatization of marriage in 1997, but just recently, in defiance of both the chairman and the executive vice president of the Cato Institute, my young colleague Jason Kuznicki wrote a research paper arguing that that was a bad idea and that the, the legal status of marriage was an important part of ordered liberty. You can find that on our website. And a question right there. Claire Guthrie Gastanyaga, Legislative Council for Equality Virginia. Um, my question is this. Uh, when you answered the question about what you would do in the Supreme Court, it presupposed that you would be up there arguing on equal protection grounds and the, the broader implications of that. Um, what happens if the Ninth Circuit exercises, unusual for it, um, judicial restraint and decides um, on the standing question or on the narrow California question of sort of the on-off spigot issue where some people are married and some people are not? I mean, what happens? Um, is there a Supreme Court argument? Uh, um, and if so, what does it look like? And, and what, how does that change the implications for people in other states <laughs> with uh, so-called marriage amendment? Well, the, the Supreme Court, um, uh, even if the uh, Court of Appeals decided on those narrow grounds, the Supreme Court could still consider it. I, I agree, though, with the implication of your question that that reduces the likelihood that the Supreme Court would, would take the case. Um, if the Supreme Court does not take this case, uh, it would apply uh, either just to California or just to the Ninth Circuit, depending on the scope of the Ninth Circuit's decision. Uh, in that case, uh, there would have to be additional litigation in other states um, that would eventually, one of those cases would eventually get to the Supreme Court. Okay, Jason. <laughs> and then uh, just Jason keep the mic the, there. Uh, 
Cato Institute. Um, I'm not going to talk about uh, whether marriage is an essential part of ordered liberty. Instead, I'd like to ask about one particular aspect of the case, which is the prospect that uh, Judge Walker's decision might be vacated. Uh, my sense is that most people don't really have an idea uh, clearly in their minds about how uh, this gets decided. And so what you get are opinions that very closely track uh, people's personal prejudices in the case. So that uh, people who think this was a terrible decision say, oh, of course this decision should be vacated. People who think it's great say, well, of course it should not. Uh, I look at it and I say to myself, well, if this case concerned only, uh, say, the free exercise of religion, and if we suddenly discovered that the judge was a Christian, uh, would we throw out the case? Uh, this strikes me as very strange, and I'd like to hear a little bit more from people who are uh, certainly more well-versed in the law than I am about how vacating or not is uh, decided. Well, the issue is, of course, the, our proponent, the proponents, and I, the proponents, of, the proponents are our opponents, so, uh, <laughs> um, and vice versa. So they have raised the question that because of the judge's uh, sexual orientation, the decision um, that he made um, almost a year ago should be vacated and we should all start over again. Well, in the first place, that is not timely. Okay? And that, I, how is it going to be resolved? It, it's been sent by the, by the Ninth Circuit to the district court. The, the judge Walker is retired and so it's been transferred to another judge. Uh, uh, we have argued, and I think quite on, we're very, very firm ground on this, that it is not timely. You cannot just, you cannot know certain facts about the judge's orientation, not raise a question about it, state, in fact, affirmatively in various different fora that that th that issue is not going to be raised and so forth, and then wait till you lose and then decide, well, wait a minute, maybe we don't like the judge's sexual orientation. Number two, on the merits, there are lots of cases and there's a lot of history here. We don't uh, constitutionally allow someone to keep a person off of the jury because of their race or because of their sex. Uh, we don't disqualify. The United States Supreme Court now does have, you mentioned Christianity, the United States Supreme Court consists of six Catholics and three Jews. Um, and we don't say that the justices of the Supreme Court can't decide cases involving abortion that the Catholic Church or death penalty the Catholic Church might care about or things such as that. We wouldn't tolerate a motion to disqualify um, just, uh, Justice um, Thurgood Marshall when he was on the Supreme Court to engage in decisions involving race or Justice Ginsburg um, to, uh, cases involving uh, gender or a woman judge not to handle a pregnancy case and so on and so on and so on. We also make the point that our opponents state that the damage of, of, of same-sex marriage or marriage equality is to heterosexual marriage. So by that standard, a heterosexual judge shouldn't be allowed to hear the case. <laughs> so we could go on and on and on. We accept that in this country that, and by the way, the point earlier about the uh, objections to Judge Walker was because he had rendered a, he had re represented people who were opposing the gay Olympics. Um, so he was on the other side as a lawyer. That's one of the reasons why he was being opposed. We accept in this society that a person has been through the Article Three process, appointed by the president, confirmed by the Senate, and this man had been on the federal bench for 25 years and was chief judge of the federal district, uh, Northern District of California, can put aside those life experiences which might conceivably affect a person's attitude towards the substance of the case. And every judge, I, per, I suggest to you, um, a, a judge, every judge is a taxpayer. So, you know, you could go on and on and on about how you could disqualify judges. I don't like to predict the outcome of motions, but we I'd rather be on this side of that motion. And, and they're lucky that we didn't ask for sanctions. Just a, a brief comment on, on this issue. I think the, the uh, supporters of Proposition 8 are, are asking for recusal, n not merely because the judge is gay, but because they argue he has an interest in the outcome of the case. That is, if he wants to get married, then clearly a decision that recognizes gay marriages in California would be personally beneficial to him. Of course, he could moot that point very easily by announcing now 
uh, that he does not want to get married. Uh, you, you could argue that he should have announced it earlier. But if he does announce it now, then that would suggest that he did not have a personal interest. There's also the question about the materiality of the interest that he has. Or put in a different context, if a guy has a couple of shares of, uh, of Exxon and he's a multimillionaire, nobody's going to worry about him ruling on a case involving the depletion allowance. If he owns an uh, independent oil company and most of his income comes from that company, then one would <coughs> be concerned about him ruling on, on, uh, on such a case. There, there is, I think, uh, um, the, the more serious question of even if the proponents of of uh, Proposition 8 were correct that he has a, an interest in the outcome, does that interest in the outcome rise to the level where you would take the draconian remedy of vacating his decision? I think you've, you've heard uh, from the panelists here that this decision was built on a mountain uh, of evidence establish, establishing social and political and, and psychological and economic costs of Proposition 8, which almost no evidence uh, coming in on the, on the other side. So you could even argue that even if he has this personal interest, that this interest probably was a uh, harmless error. And it's also of, of, of note, I think, that, the, that on the one hand, the supporters of Proposition 8 uh, argue that he has a personal interest. Then on the other hand, they argue that in California, domestic partnerships give you every bit as much rights uh, as marriages. Well, if that's the case, then the judge has no personal interest. In, uh, in getting married if he can accomplish exactly the same thing through the domestic partnership route. So I agree with, Tan that, that, with Ted that this is a, not likely to be, this recusal argument, not likely to be one that succeeds. Hi, my name is John Tollefson. I work for the State Department. And I want to ask about the political side a little bit. Is there anything that could help uh, your case in, in the eyes of the court in terms of uh, more states deciding to allow same-sex marriage or uh, increased public opinion uh, in favor of same-sex marriage. Is there anything like that that could uh, change in the next couple of years that could make it easier for justices to take the, the case and then maybe decide in favor of it? Let me say that we have about three minutes left, so I will invite you to use this question to make any final remarks you want to make. Uh, I, I think that um, the effects will be marginal. Uh, I do think that uh, the broader the acceptance, and this goes uh, from uh, decisions like something that's pending in New York to maybe um, uh, achieve uh, marriage equality through uh, legislation, uh, to even poll numbers, I think has some marginal effect of saying to the court, um, uh, this, is, this is the right time to make a decision. Um, but I think that that is is going to be more on the margin and atmospherics than it is. I mean, it certainly doesn't go to the analytical uh, issue. But um, if you've got a close uh, call, uh, those things can matter. Any other final? Well, I, I, uh, I would just note that I raised the polling in, in, in my opening statement. You know, I don't think it's I, – I, I hardly think it's dispositive. Maybe it's not even relevant to the actual uh, decision in this case. Uh, because it, uh, it, it, this is fundamentally about what the constitutional protections are about for the citizens of California. On the other hand, I noted it because I think this is a, a, an area of rapidly changing uh, expansion of people's attitudes on the question, and I think it will come up in a variety of contexts. You work at the State Department, uh, the, the recent uh, decisions to expand rights for gay families in the State Department is a good example uh, of a place where d uh, decisions in the workplace, uh, in, 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 uh, in, in sort of attitudes of, of, about how citizens are treated, are affected, I think, by uh, the change of, of uh, the way people feel about this question. And I'll come back and, and close with, that's why it is so important uh, that the decision about whether this trial can be seen by the public in general uh, ought to be decided in an affirmative sense so that people can really see uh, the testimony that was given in this case. I wanted to finish by saying that when we undertook this case, um, we understood that it was important to win it in court and in the court of public opinion. And we noted earlier when in another session we were in uh, that this is the 44th anniversary next month of Loving versus Virginia, which struck down as unconstitutional Virginia's law that prohibited interracial marriage. Um, 
And it was only 40, 20 years before that, in 1947, that California was the first court to strike down a prohibition on interracial marriage. And so 20 years after that, the United States Supreme Court decided the case unanimously. Um, that would have, uh, that case, if it had been decided the other way, if those laws had continued, would have prevented the president's mother and father from getting married. These days, it's inconceivable to us um, that that such a law could exist in the United States. Um, and those polling numbers that John was talking about show what is happening. The swing is in the public opinion has been 10 percent in most of the polls in favor of recognizing the rights of individuals to engage in marriage on the ba uh, irrespective of their sexual orientation in two years since this case was filed. It does matter because court decisions are made in the atmosphere of public opinion. But not only that, it, the important thing here is the acceptance by the public. When we win this case, if we do, we want people to react and say, of course, that's right. It's about time. Um, and not to look back on that. And that's why David and I, we, we, we appreciate this forum and we appreciate your coming because every person we can talk to that may rethink an idea that they had in their mind or be a little bit m more open to talk about it with someone else to a newspaper um, editor or journalist or in any forum, um, we felt we've we've and, and the American Foundation for Equal Rights has supported this very very strongly to put us out and and part of it is this so uh, so called odd <laughs> couple which we've heard a thousand times now at least no one said strange bedfellows here <laughs> <laughs> but it does it does help us attract attention so that people will say well okay how did you get together why what does it mean that you know that you were on the other side of this other famous cases and so forth. It gives us a chance to talk to the American people on radio and television and newspapers and so on and so forth. And we're finding, we believe, that everybody that we can talk to, that resonates out, outward and little by little, and actually it's really quite fast, the American public is changing. So when this case comes out the way we believe it should, we believe that the American people are going to say, thank God, that particular terrible vestige of discrimination is gone. Thank you, Ted Olson. Thank you, John Podesta, Bob Levy, Ted Olson, David Boys, for being here. Thank all of you for being here. Please join us upstairs for uh, lunch. <laughs>